This is Pete Feenster on Thursday the 4th of July, which is American Independence Day, talking to Chris Spedding, great guitar player, great Hello. idea, Chris. One of a dying breed of session men. I'm quite healthy, actually. I feel quite healthy. <laughs> <laughs> Absolute killer. But that's the case, isn't it? You were one of the most, and probably still are one of the most, you know, in-demand session guys. Sought after, they say. They're Sought after, that's always, the one. They're always trying to find me. Always trying to find you. And they certainly did, and you played on some seminal recordings, and it's, it's great to see you out and about. I guess we ought to start with, I want to talk about the, the past, but let's talk about now that you're playing with Andy Fraser again, after all these years. Playing yeah. with him with Sharks, of course. Yeah. Which would have been... That would have been early 70s, yeah. 71, and, uh, 72. Come round again. How did you hook up again now? Well, I got an email from Andy. Right, you know, simple as that. So, yeah. Um, and I thought, oh, this is great, you know. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I was only too pleased to hook up with him and see what he was into. And so, so I hooked up with Toby. Have you been in touch in the intervening years at all? Very infrequently. We were both living in California at one point. Yeah. And Andy still is. Uh, yeah, yeah. And we, Ran across each other a couple of times in California, but haven't actually worked together on a musical project since the Sharks. So that's why it's kind of interesting and exciting for me. Were you disappointed that the Sharks didn't work? Well, you did yeah, three albums at the finish. Andy was only yeah, on one. Yeah, he was on what? Well, Andy was disappointed. I was. We all were. Yeah, when something like that happens, it doesn't happen. Yeah. Yeah. But it was a, a great time musically for me, um, playing with someone like Andy, and um, it's great that we hooked up again. You moved to London when you were 16 years old. That must have... Is it so it says on my bit of time. So it says there, yeah. 1961. Sounds right, yeah. That must have been some kind of a move for you at the time. Well, you leave school, you want to do something. I wanted to be in the music business. Did you have any contacts down here at the time? No. Yeah. Wow. No. I worked in a music shop in the West End for a bit. Which is a good starting point to meet yeah, people, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Um, did the Vulcans come out of that? Vulcans were my school group. Before that then? Yeah, so that was before oh. I was about 14 or 15 with the Falcons. And when you first did start playing in London, were, were you playing more jazz than anything? Um, oh, lots of different things. I played in a country western outfit. We did the, the American Air Force bases. Oh, yeah. Which playing is, country western. Yeah. Um, I, I played lots of different things. You played in something called a Nat Temple Orchestra. Oh, well, that was kind of a gig band, like a, a function band. You know, we played... A, what was known as the Society Circuit, right. which was the Savoy Hotel, the yeah. Dorchester, yeah. the Hilton, for all the functions they had there. And we also did a couple of summer seasons in right. Torquay. Right. So that was another side of thing. Uh, it's another skill that I acquired, which doesn't really exist now. No. The, oh, learning all that repertoire of the old standards and the show tunes and yeah. learning all that yeah. stuff. That doesn't exist now because if you have a function, you are a DJ. Yeah, I you guess know? so, yeah. <laughs> so there's a few out there. Uh, there was a sort of tail end of that. that I, I was a young guy, I was a teenager, you know. Yeah. And all these other guys were, uh, you know, in their 40s and 50s. And you went to Australia on a cruise ship when you I were did, young? Yeah. I suppose you must have been in your teens then, must you? Yeah, that was, I think, my first professional job. Wow. Uh, but playing in the orchestra then, thinking about that, would that have been, would you have had any thought then of becoming a session guy long term? No, I never thought I had an aptitude for that, uh, but uh, apparently I did. You certainly I, did. I didn't really realise what they needed. And I think one of your first sessions was Dusty Springfield and Paul Well, Jones. no, not till later on. I, I got a job playing the bass in Dusty Springfield's road Richard band. Richard Torbida. Wow. Yeah, and at the same time with Alan Price, uh, Georgie Fame, people like that. But not in the studio. That was before my studio time right. with Dusty. I did a couple of sessions later on with, on guitar with, for her. Were um, you playing mainly rhythm in those days? I was playing mainly guitar, but I don't know you, whether you call it rhythm. Well, there was a lot, more, there was a lot more rhythm guitar parts in those days than there are. Well, yeah, now, if you, when you're doing sessions, yeah. usually 95% of what you're doing is rhythm. Yeah. If they want you to do a lead, they'll do it in the last 10 minutes of the session when yeah. you stick a quick solo on. Yeah. But most of it, you've got to be a good rhythm player. Yeah. And at one point, I did sort of take up the bass because I was bored with what was required in the middle 60s. For guitar players, that's what was a bit naff. Yeah. So I sort of thought, oh, this on. So you were always fiercely independent about what you wanted to do all the way through your career, in fact. I've been lucky in as much as I've done what I wanted to do. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, managed to do it and managed to sort of make a living at it. So yeah. not everybody's managed to do that. Even people that get, got a lot of success. That's uh, it, that's some it. of my yeah. contemporaries sort of not, not in the business anymore. So I feel like I'm quite lucky to have. When did you first started. start getting sessions in Denmark Street, Chris? Well, those are in Denmark Street. There are mainly demos, right. and that you're not really first call. You know, but that's how it would start. Uh, and maybe that might start and get yeah. your name around. Yeah, yeah. It, I think it was after I played with Jack Bruce on a song for a tailor. Yeah, that was a that's main. Right, that, that was the biggest. Well, 1969. Yeah, that was uh, the first major session, major artist that I worked with. Um, that got my name around as a session guy. I think it all, all came from there. Course, highly regarded album, of course. Yeah, oh, it still had stands up that album. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and thinking about being in bands, you joined Pete. Pete Brown's Battered Ornaments, that must have been a bit, bit of an eclectic thing for somebody who was playing all that kind of stuff before. Well, we thought of ourselves as a kind of an eclectic bunch of musicians, you know, uh, uh, jazz fusion wasn't invented then, but we no, were kind of doing it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so improvisational stuff, we had horn player George Kahn on there, yeah. and Dick Exgall Smith was in the band uh, briefly. Oh. Uh, Pete played a bit of trumpet, yeah. uh, so it was kind of that sort of direction before it was a bit ahead of its time in a way. Um, and Pete got shafted out and you ended up running the band, well, fronting the band. Was, it, was that something you... Uh, to, nobody you? else wanted to front the band. Yeah. yeah, it was kind of, yeah. So that was another string to your bow? Being a band well, leader? Well, the band folded a bit after that. Really? I've not been that successful with, uh, or lucky with my band. On songs, yeah. Yeah, more, you, more successful as a solo entity. Do you remember much about the uh, the appearance at the Hyde Park at the Stones show? I remember I'd broken my arm and I couldn't play much so I, I sort of, <laughs> sort of quickly did a crash course on playing slide guitar and got away with it. Uh, we went on just before the Stones only because we were managed by the people that promoted it. Oh, you know, right, the Black right. Enterprises. You didn't see family on that bill? Can't remember. No, we, used, we, used to do, we used to play what, on the same bill as them quite often. Uh, and now another strand of your career has always been jazz, and as you mentioned earlier, jazz fusion, and you joined Nucleus. Yeah. Did you ever play with Ray Russell and Alan Holdsworth? What were they after you? They were after me. Uh, Jay, Ray Russell was kind of on the scene oh. at the same time as me. I knew him, uh, and he did. He, he sort of came along on the session scene after I left, actually. Yeah. Ray. Yeah. And the reason I asked you that was in I think '71 you were, you were voted number two in the jazz polls of melody maker guitarist. Yes, so, so you were cast as a jazz guitarist by then, you know, by then. I was. Uh, that was as a result of the exposure I got with Nucleus. Yeah. yeah. Um, were you yeah. happy with that? Was that the direction you saw yourself as going in then? What, being number two? Uh, no, jazz being, 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 <laughs> jazz, <laughs> being a jazz guitarist. Yeah. Oh, not really, because if I had a jazz phase, it would have been in the 60s. When it was booming, yeah. Um, when the fusion thing came on, I'd sort of left jazz as being like a bit of a musical backwater. Yeah. And went into rock and roll, which I put, thought was like at the forefront of yeah. musicals activity. Was always that, yeah. Uh, and so I, when Nucleus came along, I was to my head was totally out of jazz yeah. into rock and roll. Yeah, yeah. And the thing about the musicians in Nucleus, all the others were all all jazzers. Yeah. Jazz yeah, musicians. Yeah, yeah. And they kind of needed a rocker yeah. to make it into a fusion group, yeah. a to call it a jazz, you know, a guy who could play yeah. rock and roll guitar, yeah. but also relate musically to the, all the jazz musicians. So I had that background in jazz. You provided a strand of continuity. And I yeah. think that's probably why I got chosen, but it was a very fruitful time. I enjoyed it. And the first record they did was, I thought was really good. And I enjoyed the time. And I'm glad I did it, but uh, as yeah. I say, I was, I kind of, my head was out of jazz when I was playing oh, that's what strange. was called jazz fusion. And you never, you, you were never into the the blues boom, were you? I no. mean, you're not into blues. I was probably, probably into the jazz thing when you know, the blues boom was happening. I found out about people like Albert King and B.B. Yeah. King quite late on. Right, in amazing. The, in the 70s. Amazing. Uh, I'm wondering when you did War of the Worlds, which was some time after that, was was that when it really set you up as a, a top to go to session player because that sold a million? Oh, I think I was probably uh, that was the last project I did before I relocated in the United States. So I'd been through my session career by then. Right. So I'd, I'd had my sort of okay. little single hit single oh, and, and um, uh, come back into this, you know. Where where did the Wombles fit into all of this? 
Oh, no, another, right another of the session things. Session guys, yeah. yeah. Did you did you um, team up with Mickey most with a with a view to becoming more pop, as it were? Not necessarily well, a pop star. After the Sharks more finally broke stuff. up, yeah, which was uh, a couple of years after Andy had left, we we tried with Buster Jones on bass. Yeah. Uh, which, Buster Cherry. Yeah. Um, yeah. He was our replacement. We got kind of lucky to get him because after losing Andy, we thought, oh, who are we going to get? You know, who's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Who's, who's like a yeah. the same type of larger than life type yeah. of personality on the bass, and yeah. we got Buster Jones, which oh, was, right. filled his shoes fairly well. Um, but after that, finally, break broke up. I went back to doing sessions, and um, let's see, yeah. You also you also toured with uh, we're doing this for Get Ready to Rock so I mentioned you also toured with uh, Roy Harper on HQ of course. Yeah. And I've got a quote here for, if you can throw this out. You said that the John Cale band of '75 was perhaps the most exciting live band you've ever played with. Right. Uh, I, th I think I probably still say that, and the reason for that was that there was a musical anarchy in that band, in, in as much as John would count something in it. Yeah, a, a, a crazy tempo. It would change the key. It wow. would start a song that we didn't know. Yeah. That we had just written, and I loved that because I just right. sort of because the, the the old jazzer in me would come yeah. out yeah. and it's improvisationary yeah. stuff. Uh, the drummer Timmy Donald used to hate that because right. he was more of a rock drummer who liked liked to at least have tried something out at the sound check. Yeah, yeah. Knows where know where the uh, tempo was, but I loved it. Well, he's a drummer. And for that <laughs> for that reason, that's why I made that quote. Yeah. It's oh, that's a good very one. unusual to find in a, in a rock context the same sort of freedom and as you do in the jazz. Yeah. yeah. And John Cale provided that. We should also ask you. You almost joined the Stones, of course. Well, oh, I was. At, there was a story that I was asked, but I think maybe Mick Jagger was winding me up. Oh, really? Basically. Yeah. So I, once the cat's out of the bag, I have to keep answering that question. So, uh, moving on from that, was was the Vibrators your first step into punk rock, as it were? No, the Sex Pistols were. You did a demo for I them. Did a demo you? with yeah. them, produced them, and then Malcolm McLaren put on the punk rock festival. I couldn't find a band. And he said, "Come along with the sound check. The Vibrators are pretty good. They'll learn a couple of your tunes." Yeah. And so that's what we did, and we did the gig, and I was signed up to Rap Records with Mickey Most at the Most time, yeah. and I ended up doing an a record with them, a single. I played on their record, they played on mine. Ah. We went on TV a couple of times. Yeah, you were all over the TV at the time. Yeah. Mike um, Mansfield, yeah. So we did. That's my thing with the Vibrators. All right. Actually, I just did a, uh, um, a track with them. Really. Uh, some Californian uh, company called Cleopatra Records. Yes, they it's more of a prog out, label, funnily enough. But right, yeah. they put out a Vibrators album and they sent uh -huh. me, this is what we do as session guys now, we get MP3s through the mail, yeah. we put our part on yeah. and then mail it back. And that's what you do. And they sent me a check, yeah. Oh, and I did a really enjoyable uh, track with, for the Vibrators. Right. Um, Second Skin, I think it's called. Right. And I really liked it. I just got the record the other day through the, the CD through the mail. Oh, well, look out for that. Be Second Skin by the Vibrators, and that's me on the guitar. Excellent. <laughs> uh, as, a, as, a, so, as you are on so many of these records, you also toured in Roxy Music. Was that a creative period for you? Oh, yeah. Working? Well, I've been doing sessions since, with Brian Ferry since about 1974, since so his uh, sense, yeah. Let's Stick Together period. Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, we've had an honour for the thing with, with, with Brian and with Roxy Music. In fact, Andy and me in the Sharks supported Roxy Music on their second on tour. Their sec must have been something like that, yeah. Yeah, in Amazing. 1972. Full so we know, you know, I know it was them from yeah. back then. Uh, three, three, four more questions, Chris. Um, you moved to New York in 78. What kind of music scene did you find there when you went there? Well, it was similar to, to, to London. It was in the middle of the New punk way, thing, yeah. the CBGBs, you know, the Ramones and uh, Blondie were happening there, Talking Heads, uh, yeah. you know, and I was... You fitted uh, into that? Well, uh, yeah. Well, I never really fitted into that here. <laughs> I was a bit old. I mean, it was in my 30s when a punk oh, thing happened. Oh, yes, yeah. So uh, I was never really a punk. No, no. But I'd, had no, a, I like I'd already had a career up to yeah, 1977, so. so. And, and thinking yeah. about your solo career, your album Guitar Graffiti, I think that was the first one you ever produced yourself, wasn't it? Oh, not really, no. I had. I go back to about 1970 with Harvest Records, with my own albums. And you produced them? I, but, hmm. 
I feel like I produced them, but maybe I wasn't credited with producing. Yeah, I don't think you were. All right, well, maybe, yeah. Well, You're probably you right then. That was probably the first one I was credited with producing. Um, and, and the real $64 million question I wanted to ask you was, did you, did you actually play with Les Paul? I did. And how was that? Because he's an amazing uh, Oh, actually, player. no. What actually happened, I thought I was going to play with Les Paul. He called me up. I don't know how he found out I was there. I just booked a table, I booked it under my own name, so maybe somebody recognised the name. And he said, I believe there's a guitar player called Chris Spedding in the audience. Not a recommendation. Uh, really. So, can you, you know, invite him up to the stage? So I so, thought, oh great, I get to play with Les. But no, Les gave me his guitar. And sat really? down in the front row. Impressed me. <laughs> uh, folded his arms, crossed his legs and sort of thing. Wow. Uh, so I had to play with his trio. So technically, no, I didn't. Well, that's close I feel enough. like I did. That's close <laughs> two more, two more questions. Um, were you surprised at the uh, commercial success of motorbiking? No. It, I, I, it was I, aimed at being a hit at the time. Of course, and, it was. Yeah. Almost everything I've ever done was aimed at being that. That was the only time I, <laughs> it was a success. Yeah. <laughs> you ask any any musician, you, you don't go in, in in the studio to not sell records. And was there a weight of expectation after you had the the hit with that? Yes. And disappointment <laughs> when I didn't, yes. <laughs> and, fi and, and finally, um, any sessions that you particularly remember, your favourite sessions, and for what reason? Uh, Hell of a question, but... Nah. Uh, I'd upset everybody. If I'd mentioned one person, I'd upset, uh, upset about 5,000 5, people. How about Toby, yeah? <laughs> if, I, if I was invited to be on one of his records, fantastic. <laughs> well, you've played on everybody else's records. It's been fantastic yes. talking to you. Pete Fiends for talking to Chris Penny for right. getting to rock dot com. Been a pleasure. Thank, Thank you, Tony. Agent on the camera. Good afternoon. Brilliant.